Hey, today I want to talk about how we develop code on a different machine or for a different machine. Hey everybody, welcome back. Today's video addresses an issue that comes up a lot for students or others just getting started in programming. And that problem is how to work remotely. Now I'm not talking about working from home. We're all getting good at that thanks to the pandemic, but I'm talking about when you have a project where you're writing code and you're working on your laptop, but the code isn't gonna run on your laptop. It was gonna run on a server or some other machine somewhere else. So to give you a concrete example, in my operating systems class that I teach at Clemson University, my students, they may be using whatever machines they're using. They may have Mac OS, they may have Windows, they may have Linux, but I use an auto grader to test their code. So all of their projects are going to run on one of our Linux lab machines, and that's the machine that their code needs to work on no matter what operating system they have running on their own machine. If their code doesn't work on the Linux machine that I'm gonna run their code on, then it doesn't work, and they're not gonna get the grade that they want. And of course, this isn't just a classwork problem. This shows up professionally all the time. Anytime that you have code that's going to run on a server, you, you need to get that code out there. It doesn't matter if it runs locally. If it doesn't run on the server, it doesn't run. So the question is, is how should I go about doing this? Now, this is part of a much bigger problem. Today, I'm just going to give you a few simple examples of how you can approach this as a student or someone just getting started, and then we can build on this with bigger, more scalable, large-scale software approaches that might be more appropriate for a large industrial setting. But today, I just wanna show you a few simple ways that you can go about doing this that some of you newer folks may not be aware of. And I can almost guarantee that I'm gonna miss something that's someone's favorite way of doing this, and so feel free to drop it down in the comments if there's something you felt like I missed. And of course, as always, I'll try to pick it up in a future video. Now, also for now, I'm gonna stick with the simple case where I'm trying to write code for a single remote machine. Things, of course, are going to get more complicated when you're trying to write a program that's going to run on a million different machines and you need to test it on different platforms. Things also get more complicated when you have a bunch of developers all working on the same code that's going to be running on a remote machine. So there's a lot of ways that it can get more complicated and I'm happy to tackle those in a future video, but that's not going to happen today. Today, I'm just talking about one developer, one piece of code on a remote machine. So let's look at a scenario really quick. Let's say that I'm trying to write a program for a remote machine. Okay, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to use a remote machine, joey 8 computing.clemson.edu. This is one of the lab machines that we use for my class. Though what I'm doing here isn't specific to that machine. Pretty much any machine that's open to SSH connections is going to work this way. Okay, so let's look at my options. Let's start first with option zero. It's option zero because it's not really a good option in my opinion, and that's just to develop your code on whatever machine you're on and just hope for the best. This is definitely the path to the dark side, folks where you live in fear and get bad grades, but so many students do this and it makes me sad just thinking about how many bad project grades have come from this nonsense, so don't do that. Now, option number one is the most bare bones. It's maybe the most obvious, and that is just to work in the terminal over SSH. So if you haven't seen SSH before, SSH stands for Secure Shell, and it's simply a tool for logging into another machine securely, or at least more securely than Telnet, which is how we used to do it back in the old days when nobody cared about security and passwords drifted in plain text across the internet. This is not going to be an exhaustive SSH tutorial. There is a lot of information out there about SSH and how to use it. I just wanna make you aware of it. In here in the terminal, let's just use SSH to log into Joey8 dot computing dot clemson dot edu and this is going to log me in if all goes well it's going to log me into this server and great so notice that it didn't ask me for a password that's because i've set up ssh to use a pair of keys that i created let me know in the comments if you want me to talk any more about that in a future video but it replaces my password so for now i can just find the directory that i want so let's say i want to go into repos remote work i come in here let's just clean this up a little and I have a file here that is test.c, and then I can use my favorite in terminal editor, and I pause here because whatever I say is likely to lead to a holy war in the comments, but yes, let's just say you use a terminal editor, like let's just use VI, right? Let's say VI or one of its many relatives, I'm not gonna pick favorites here, and I just say VI test.c, okay, great. And so I have a simple program down here, let's just come down and I can add hello world, Great. And we can save it and we get out. Okay. Now, for those of you that have an allergic reaction to VI, Vim, Neo, Vim, etc., you can also use Emacs. Or for those of you that can't stand Emacs, you can use Micro, Pico, Nano. There are a lot of options depending on how you like to edit documents and what's available on the machine you're using. I'm not going to judge. The point is that you can do this and you can just edit your files and then compile them 
and we can just run them. You know, forgive me for not using a make file. I normally would set this up, but the point is on working remotely. So I'm just showing you, you can compile and run and edit right here in the terminal on the remote machine, no problem. And of course you can use tmux or, you know, an iterm here. I can just split the pane vertically and I could use this to actually set up another SSH session. And so I could have, let's go into repos, remote work. And now I could CD into that same directory and I could have one of these terminal windows for compiling and one of these for editing. So, you know, I can definitely have my code up here and I can be compiling it over here and switch back and forth if you're worried about that. If you don't wanna have switching, that works just fine. Now, for some of you, this is gonna feel clunky, but if you get good at in-terminal editing, it's really not that bad. I know a lot of great developers who do everything in the terminal and they're amazingly fast at it. So I'm not saying it's the right option for you, but it's definitely one that you should consider, you should check out. I wouldn't scoff at it initially until you've actually tried it out. But okay, let's say you don't like in-terminal editors. You're like, I want an editor window, I want an IDE. Well, most of you know I'm not crazy about IDEs. I've explained why in other videos, but I do enjoy using an out-of-terminal text editor from time to time. as is apparent from most of my videos, I use VS Code. So another option you can use, I'm not sure I recommend it, but I wanna mention it just so you're aware of it, we'll call this option 1A, is let's just close out our terminal sessions here. But so in this terminal session, I can just say, we're gonna do that same SSH connection, but we're gonna pass in, we're gonna do X, Y here. X and Y both basically say, we want you to forward X11 packets. I use both options because I'm not sure what form of authentication is being used on this server, what it supports. So anyway, I'm just, this will allow me to get things working. What this says is it looks just like it did before. Let's go back into repos, remote work. And what this is saying is if I have an X11 server like Xquartz running over here on my Mac, then what this allows me to do is it allows me to do something like this. I can say G edit, test.c, and that's gonna run gedit, asking it to open this .c file, and it's going to forward all of the rendering packets over to my machine. And it takes a while to show up, but my machine is going to display the window. Now let me, hold on, let's, didn't really size it the way I wanted, but that's okay. Here, come over here. Now I know I just gave a bunch of you a heart attack by using gedit. You're like, what are you doing? You're using gedit, but there's a reason that I didn't just try to use VS Code. One advantage of gedit, if I'm going this route, is it's available on just about every machine, at least any flavor of Linux out there, and it's fairly lightweight. Now the lightweight is the key part, is that you notice that it was a little clunky. It took a little while to show up. Forwarding X11 packets is cool, but it's super slow. And if I were to use this with VS Code, well, why don't we just try it out? We'll try it out. But anyway, I mean, you can see, the point is you can see here that this code did get loaded in gedit. It's great. I could edit this right in place, just like gedit was running on my machine, just being slow. Uh, close you. But let's say instead that I used VS Code to open this directory, then we could be waiting here for a while because this is gonna take a long time. And once it shows up, it's going to be hardly usable because VS Code is much more heavyweight. There's a lot more rendering going on. And yeah, it's coming through eventually. Okay, there's that familiar look we, we know and love. But yes, so here I could then click on test.c and if I'm willing to wait for five minutes until it actually gives me the ability to edit, then I could go about and do this. But this is way too clunky unless you have a blazing fast internet connection, which clearly I don't between my server and my machine, this is gonna be just unusably slow. There's, it's cool, but there's no way I'm gonna do this from day to day because it's just too inefficient. So let's close this out. So this leaves me with the question of, let's say that I wanna use something like VS Code, but I don't want it to be super clunky. I want it to feel like I'm using VS Code on my local machine, but I just wanna edit files on my remote machine. Then a better option is to use something like a an extension or a plugin to the editor of your choice. So I'm typically using VS Code these days. And here, let's just check it out really quick. Okay, so if I open up VS Code, so I have a plugin, it's already installed, but let me just show you quickly if I look in my preferences and extensions, I can come down here and you notice I have a bunch of different extensions installed. 
One of them that I installed is this remote SSH extension. This is provided by Microsoft, super handy. I use it a lot, but it's installed. So I'll leave you to install it yourself. But what it allows me to do is I can come down here, this little green corner down here. And I say, if I click on this, it's gonna pop up and I can say, connect to host. Okay, now it will allow me, if you, the first time you set this up, you can go to add new SSH host. I've already done this for Joey 8. That's the one we were just connecting to. But now I can click on this. The one annoying thing is it is opening up a new window. I wish it would just use the window that I had before, but it didn't. So then basically it's it's now connected. You can see down here, it's here, let me bring this up, getting too many windows involved. But so we can see down here, it is connected to Joey 8. So it's connected, but we're like, where's my files? So if I say open folder, then I can just jump down here and say, I will just go repos or slash remote work. And then you can see the files there. But if I just say, okay, then that's gonna open this folder remotely on Joey 8. And so I can see the code here and apparently it's having a little bit of trouble, but now let's see, we reload the window and it's okay. Okay, so we seem like we're connected, we're okay. If I jump over into terminal, one thing that's really cool is it's automatically given me an SSH terminal into this machine, into Joey 8 at repos remote work. So if I come in here, I can, you know, again, compile on the remote machine. And this is happening remotely. This is not happening on my own machine. So I can run hello world. That's fine. I can edit it in place. And you notice it is responsive because it's actually VS Code is running on my local machine. It's just changing the files. It's saving them remotely using SSH. And my terminal is connected to SSH. So everything's happening on the remote machine, but the rendering of my editor is happening locally on my machine. So it's responsive. So what do I use in practice? I usually use the first option, just working in the terminal for really quick edits. It's much faster actually than setting this up. I don't need to create new windows or anything. It's just, it's really fast to just SSH in, change a couple of files, and and jump out. Now for longer sessions, I do use this approach. Now the big drawback of both of these options is that they require an internet connection. What if my connection goes down? What if I wanna edit my files when I'm in the car or on the beach or somewhere where I can't get to reliable connectivity and maybe I don't wanna set up a mobile hotspot? That happens a lot for me and in that case, I recommend that you look into using a virtual machine or VM as we call them. And basically we wanna create a virtual machine that's a close replica or maybe an exact replica of the machine that you're going to run your code on eventually. Now, I don't have time to go into that today, how to set up VMs, because when you're running VMs, you can run into your own issues with resources and lagginess. So I'm definitely planning to pick that up in a future video in the coming weeks. Subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss it. Let me know if you have other video requests and I'll see you later.